Hello, everyone. We are live. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Caitlin McKegg. I am a real estate broker here in Phoenix, Arizona. Thanks for joining me. Today, I have a special guest. If you look for information on YouTube about real estate in Phoenix, you have more than likely seen his videos and come across his channel. Rick McCone is joining me today, and he is an excellent resource for all that's going on in Phoenix. I figured it would be wonderful to have him on. He had me on his channel months ago, so we are back together. Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining. Yeah, Caitlin, thank you for having me. And all of a sudden, my phone started playing something. And I... <laughs> <laughs> now this will be fun. It's uh, it's fun to have this little YouTube community that we're in. It is. We have so much crossover between folks that watch each of our channels. So it's cool to come together and talk. And I know I watch a lot of your videos as well and learn new stuff from you. So it's really great that we can all, you know, get together and talk about talk real estate. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of and also on the YouTube front. I go, oh, she did one at four o'clock. That's a good time. Maybe I should, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know it's it's hard. Well, hopefully we have some people joining. If you guys are out there, drop us some comments, ask us your questions. We are here um, to, you know, really just chat real estate and um, and also answer questions. Um, keep it kind of casual, but also, you know, talk about what we think things could do in the market come 2023. Um, oh, we got Marks here. You're my two favorite right. area real estate YouTubers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All now, right. It's um, um, it's a wild and interesting time, um, at especially at the pace of which everything happened. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, I was telling you earlier, I said, I, you, you always try to go back and look at history, right? You know? And we don't have anything to compare it to. Mm -hmm. so, so I can't, you know, people like to compare it to 2008. There's no correlations at all. No. So you go back to 1979 to 83, the last time we had a huge spike in interest rates. And there's huge differences there as well. So it, it doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to be a big macro economist, but you do try to go back and look a little and go, OK, well, what what can I glean out of this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very different. And I was talking about this on my Instagram the other day, um, and I think I mentioned it on my Monday update, too. The biggest difference is our lack of supply right now. And we just have this lock in effect, as they're saying, where people aren't willing to sell because they like their payment. They have a low rate. Um, and you know, I'm one of those people I'm holding on to that too. I don't really want to, I don't have a reason to get out. And I think it, it turns into the only people selling are the ones that have to for a life event, um, you know, relocation, that kind of thing. And in, in some ways I'm thankful for that because that's, what's keeping us from actually crashing. If we had a skyrocketing supply, we'd be in pretty big trouble with the lack of demand we have right now. Yeah, I uncovered some numbers looking at that. And that's, you know, if the, when people, I always caution people, don't look at real estate agents to predict the future. Uh, but we do have access to a lot of data that other people don't that lets us kind of guess in the near term, mm -hmm. you know, make educated, you know, predictions. But I, I don't know what the end of 2023 is going to look like. But I went back and looked at the numbers of the 2008 crash. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, you know, we had 58,000 listings at that time. And today we ton. have 20,000. But there was a yeah. number that was hidden from that, Caitlin. And that is that there were, on top of that, 30,000 pre-foreclosures. That's a whole different thing. So that's 88,000 homes that mm -hmm. are for sale. <laughs> yeah. And now we're sitting at 20,000. And it and while people speculated that uh, that all oh, no people won't stay in their house and everything, it's abundantly clear that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. Just exactly staying put. And what are the foreclosure numbers now? It's like three hundred or something like that. I Maybe not. Spiked up a little bit to five or six, but it wasn't because of what we're going through now. It's just that it was suppressed for a long time because of the. Uh, um, you know, you couldn't foreclose. What's the term I'm trying to remember here? Forbearance. Mm -hmm. um, 
So those are shaking loose now. So some of them didn't quite recover from that. Uh, right. But it, it's such a tiny number. It's not even up to what we, and I hate to use the word normal, but it's not even up to what we see as normal anymore. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the, the hardest thing for everyone to understand is how quickly things changed, because I don't know if we've had a market shift this quick, um, you know, maybe I guess in, in 07, 08, but um, this just happened so quickly and we still have like this lack of people. I still hear people talk about how nutty the real estate market is. And I'm like, not, not real. I mean, nutty in a different way, but yeah. it's not what it used to be. I'm like, Oh, it's still good out there. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Your realtors are finally starving. No, I'm not. I, uh, you know, don't, don't be mean. Um, I see. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, in May, it just fell off the roof, just mm -hmm. absolutely tanked. And then mm -hmm. now it's just staying right. I keep using my hands a lot, but it's staying right here. And list yeah. prices, tell me if you've seen this, list prices have come down and then they're staying right here. But at the same time, seller contributions are going up. So my right. consensus is they're not budging on their price because they want to be able to have some extra so that they can give back to the buyer. Right. Exactly. It could be all wet, but that's what it says to me. So. Exactly. You know, I actually just had an appraiser call me the other day who was comping a property um, that was one of my sales. And his question was, I see that there was a concession of $13,000 to your buyer. Would the sale have gone through if your buyer didn't get that concession? And I was like, no, actually, she needed that concession because the her payment was going to be too high. So without that buying down a rate, um, no sale wouldn't have gone through. And he's like, okay, well, that's extremely helpful. So appraisers are taking that into consideration that, you know, the price might be $13,000 than what it normally would have been if you just take out those concessions. And I don't think appraisers were always so on top of that in the past, but there certainly seems like taking a look at that closer now. Well, what are some of the watch outs that you see in the first quarter of next year? You know, I think it's going to be kind of slow um, to start, but it really is all going to be depending on rates. Um, so we're, you know, the year is pretty much over, I think, as it relates to real estate at this point. Transaction volume is down. It's only going to get less throughout the rest of the year. It always does during the holidays. So we'll continue to see a drop off on that. Um, January is usually when things start to spike up. But if we're still in this high rate environment and there is no change on that front, I think we might just continue where we're at until rates maybe tick down a tiny bit. Um, and if that happens, then especially if that coincides with like our springtime, we might actually start to see a lot of activity coming back. But it really all hinges on rates, in my opinion. What do you think? Well, there's so many moving parts out right now. Uh, Phoenix, love the state 48. I love these guys. <laughs> I, I got a couple of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, um, there's, there's just too many moving parts to make a guess, except I can say that in January, um, I don't see anything on the horizon that says, here come the new listings. I just don't. And I right. think, you know, we're sitting at about 20,600 now. And the only reason that's grown is because they aren't selling because we're we're putting on fewer and fewer new listings every week. Right. Every week the chart keeps going down. I track it every day. And so I don't that may come up a little bit, but I'll bet you we're still 20,600 second week of January because it's going to whittle down in November, December, October, September 1st. I'm guessing that we, you know, at the end of the month, how you always get these expired listings. Mm -hmm. So we have like 200 every seven days. And then at the end of the month, because that's when contracts are written, it expires at the end of the month. Um, we spiked up to like 500, 600. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a thousand on November yeah. 1st because yeah. it's the holidays. I'm, it didn't sell. Let's just let, let I'm not going to relist it now. Let's just leave it alone. So, and so real estate agents, you've got pl plenty of people that you can call them badger now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's so true. It's like if any real estate agents use that as prospecting methods, it's like their dream come true. Canceled and expired. A whole bunch of them. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, good question in here about iBuyers. Um, overpaying for houses seem to be a catalyst to raise prices. Do you think it'll also be a catalyst to bring them back down? What do you think, Rick? I, I would say not so much because, um, and then I'll, I'll preface it here for a second, that, you know, the, the prices went up nationally. Um, so I don't think they had quite that much to do with, with pushing prices up. I think the interest rates in the threes where all kinds of institutional investors came in and just kept feeding the beast, that did it. Everything rose. And, uh, and Zillow did it. And then they lost $800 million. Right now, you've got 1,500 homes owned by Open Door, And um, they're going to have to clear them out. And uh, they, they, I don't think their prices are coming in below market. It's just that they started so high. You know, they were buying homes for 650 that weren't worth a dime over five. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you see them go from 650 to 480, well, that's probably where they should have been anyway. So I don't know if they're really pulling the market down that much. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it's a combination. Like you said, I do think they had so they bought for so high for so many properties too. They were buying up a bunch. Uh, so I think that, Maybe not on a national scale. I don't know. I think locally they had a pretty, a fairly decent impact on our market, I think, in terms of prices. And now they're, they've swung the pendulum the other way so far. Um, I think it is kind of, well, Tina Tambor was saying that appraisers are considering uh, I buyer sales, distressed sales. Did you hear that? Oh, I didn't. That's that. That seems about right. Yeah. So they're starting to like weight them as such because they know that they're selling that, that basically the data isn't necessarily valid because they either paid way too much to buy it or they've slashed the price so much just to offload it um, that they're not really weighting them as heavily. So I do well, think they are, impacted. they are the new foreclosures because you think about it, you know, the average person doesn't have to sell their house in a foreclosure. Uh, the banks have to sell the house. They don't want it on their books. Well, open door, they have to sell the homes. They don't want to keep them. And I, I know in talking with my lender friend, Pat, he, uh, he's got a gentleman that wants to write an offer on a particular open door home. And he's got agents saying, oh, no, you don't want to write him an offer that low. And I said, why not? It yeah. takes you 20 minutes, half an hour. They, and they always come back. They always come back and go, well, you know, we're a little off here. Let's talk. So they're, they're yeah. trying to move them. But I, all right, low ball open door offers all day if somebody wants me to. So Yeah. I wrote one uh, for 250 low. <laughs> Didn't get anywhere. Well, I wrote one okay. that was about 80 or 90, I think. And they called the next day and they go, yeah, yeah, we're not close yet. Um and through the conversation, I think we went up, we got them down like 40 or 50, mm -hmm. which was yeah. pretty good at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've actually been surprised how little they've negotiated on them. Um, they'll come down, but it, I think they have a timeline as far as when they'll actually drop to a certain threshold. And they hold pretty tight to that, in my experience. Yeah, their pricing has nothing to do with the motion. It's all on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. They just flip through it and go, uh, let's see, we weren't going to lower that price until next Thursday. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even tell you come back next Thursday. <laughs> New construction in the West Valley. Do you guys think builders absolutely need to offload by the end of the year? I do. I think we'll see a little bit more movement from builders in the next couple months. That's my opinion. I don't. I mean, they're definitely going to have more incentives, but I don't think they have a fiscal uh, deadline to to offload, you know, by the end of the year. I mean, they're because they're they're all <coughs> already looking ahead to Q1, and Q2 of next year. So they I'm sure that the prices that they've got now, they're going to ride that through to December, just like uh, everybody else, you know, like I'm not going to list to the holidays. The builders know they're not going to get all the traffic, but if the middle of January, they're not seeing things, you know, footprints increase, 
then I think I, I agree with you, Caitlin. They're going to go more incentives. Yeah. I think they're, uh, I think we're going to start to see, I just did a TikTok on this the other day. I think we're going to start to see a lot of, uh, a lot more um, like spec homes come to market from the builders because of canceled contracts from buyers. I think we had like a flood of that when rates started to go up and people couldn't afford them. But I think we're getting another wave of that. And then we're also, I've talked to a few people who uh, are locked into their builder contract and don't want to be anymore because they know they could go buy a resale home for a cheaper price right now than what they got under contract in January for. And they, uh, or, you know, they chose this builder because it was the only thing they could afford at the time. So they're buying in the outskirts somewhere like Queen Creek or something like that, where they didn't really want to be, but it was the best they could get when the market was crazy. And now they're like, oh, I could actually afford to be in Gilbert instead if I just buy a resale home. So um, I've had a few conversations about that. People deciding to get out of their contract, even forfeiting their earnest money to do that. So I, I feel like, I don't know, if I've talked to a few people already, that may be a good trend. Because those earnest monies are pretty hefty. Yes. Yes. This uh, one person I talked to, it was like 20 or 25,000. Yeah. Ouch. It's wild. Yeah. I just can't write that kind of check as an earnest money. So. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, can't think about it. Uh, any change in your opinion of YouTubers who are predicting a crash? No change. No. <laughs> they, Cause you remember when they were predicting them early 2020. And I, was I, I, say. I know one gentleman in California and he just, He's, you know, the white shirt and tie and the two plaques behind him. And he just goes, it's insanity. He never once would share a number. And and I know that, first of all, he's only been a realtor less than two years. Looked him up on Zillow. He hasn't sold a house. And he <laughs> had admitted um, that he was preaching doom and gloom because it gets views. So he's making all kinds of buku bucks on YouTube. And when the party's over and people stop watching the crashing things, he'll he'll go back to surfing like he was there's you can, you know, the clock is right 24 hours a day. Right. So these guys can keep saying crash, crash, crash. Eventually might get it right. But the thing that really bothered me about him, Caitlin was that they never really shared any numbers. Now reventure consulting would start to dive into some numbers, but he was so sensationalist about it that it was hard, hard to watch, but I respect his opinion and I watch him and I look at the numbers but I don't see this 50% wipeout that his thumbnail keeps saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. A broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, you can say <laughs> there's going to be a crash for ever. You'll be right eventually. But um, yeah, I just don't think what we have right now supports a crash. Uh, and it's really easy to just make videos on the doom and gloom. And a lot of people take advantage of that, unfortunately. Well, I think you, you can make a video where you speculate there's going to be a crash, or you can make a video where you show the current data and you look at a chart turning, you look at certain things that are heading a certain direction, and you can make sound decisions based on that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think, um, you know, so there's a difference between looking at the data, analyzing it, coming to a conclusion, or looking for data that feeds your narrative. Mm -hmm. I think, too, it depends on how you define a crash, because I don't know that there's an actual definition of a certain percentage. Uh, do you? Am I missing something? Or Well, I have people tell me I'm not buying until we go down 30 percent. And I say 30 percent from what? Right. 2020, right. the peak in May. Um, to me, I, I look at a crash at over 40 percent. And I mean... 2008 is the only crash I've seen in my lifetime. And I've been through lots of ups and downs and correction. But by crash, I mean the whole financial system collapsed, just absolutely imploded. People were walking away from these homes. They were stripping them of their copper and their air conditioning units and their ceiling fans and leaving them abandoned. HOAs weren't getting any more money. So they couldn't even maintain the common grounds. That's a crash. So it would take a financial calamity for that to re reoccur because, again, everybody's sitting on 4%, 3% mortgages. 
So they, you know, they could sit back and watch for a while, if not a long time. Mm -hmm. Could have rampant unemployment. Don't know. I mean, there's so much going on out there that keeps me up at night. Um, but at the same time, it's going to show up in a movement of one of the metrics that we look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as Tina from the Cromford Report always talks about, there's options for people now that aren't just foreclosure. So more than likely you have equity in your house. If you bought, um, you know, in 2021, for sure, you have equity, um, a decent amount. And instead of just going to foreclosure immediately, first of all, you have some time to be in pre-foreclosure before you sell. If you end up having to sell, you can still probably make money and not come to the closing table owing money because you had enough equity. And from the, even if you don't want to do that, you can probably rent out your house to cover your mortgage if your payment's low enough. If you are at a 3% rate, you might actually be able to like cash flow on rent depending on where you're at. Um, and how, you know, just rent it out and go stay with family or something like that and keep the house and still be uh, afloat. So there's just with the equity that we've gained over the last few years, there's just more options for people than to just walk away. It's a yeah, totally nobody's going to get the reset letter now that says your payment's going from 900 to 1600. Those mm -hmm. letters are not going to go out in the next year or two because mm -hmm. people didn't get those kinds of loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so, you know, there's a lot to um, unemployment that will lead to defaults, but defaults don't always lead to actual foreclosures. I, I agree. That's, uh, you know, we, we've had periods of high unemployment before and real estate didn't crash. Mm -hmm. Went yeah. down. Yeah. Well, in history, I think the only time we've had a significant crash is 2008 and 1929. Um, when you look at the, the cycles, um, it's really would be wild to see something like what we just experienced in 08 happen again for different reasons. Not well, saying I went, it can't, I just don't see it right now. I went back and looked at some historical numbers when it comes to uh, government debt. And 1940s, uh, we had um, debt in the 80% uh, of GDP after World War II. And then it went down to the 30s. Um, starting in the 60s and got down to 33, 32 percent uh, back when Nixon was president. It was 33 percent when he took us off the gold standard, 33 percent of GDP. Right. And then Chairman Volcker raised the rates in 1979. And then in 1981, I think it was Reagan lowered taxes and he could afford to because we got down to 31 percent of GDP as far as our debt. So they could afford to do more things to get things going. What scares me now, we're 125% of our GDP. So there isn't a lot of wiggle room there for the, for the treasury to come in and, you know, and give us more stimulus. Cause right now we have too much stimulus. So if they get inflation down somehow and they get those numbers back in line, um, you still kind of have to load the gun to get things kick-started mm -hmm. that's going to be a long road and i don't see inflation coming down at all in 2023 despite what other people are saying it's just uh you know um oil is oil and uh i mean i'm waiting for the next arab oil embargo they're already threatening us today i mean i was one of those guys that had to gas up on odd and even days and <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me if that shows up again yeah no kidding it's, it'll be interesting to see. we got a long way to go. You think there'll be a decent size uptick in listings in the West Valley after the Super Bowl? Uh, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. What do you think, Rick? Well, look, the Super Bowl is going to help you for two weeks. So I, I don't, you know, the Airbnbs are probably doing okay right now anyway, just because our tourism hasn't hasn't suffered, but I don't think anybody's sitting on an empty house and waiting for that two week period. And then they're going to sell it. Um, you know, after the Super Bowl, we've got spring training mm -hmm. and that's when they really fill up. And that's when most people make their bread and butter. So mm -hmm. the Super Bowl is going to be like icing on the cake, but it's our general uh, tourist season from December through April that pays the bills. So I don't see 
the Super Bowl is going to come in your Airbnb that you are getting um, $200 a night. You're probably going to get a thousand bucks a night for two weeks and then mm -hmm. it's gone, but you're still going to get $200 a night. Yeah. So yep. I don't, I don't see that. And I didn't see an uptick of people in buying them to get ready for the Super Bowl Cause that's, that's a big investment for a two week party. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Hi Rowena. I'm glad you're here. Alaska. Alaska. Yes. So Rick, I got to ask you, um, and I didn't prepare you for this question, but I know, you know, all of this, you talk a lot about, um, the water issue in Arizona. Yeah. You've done a few videos on that. What, uh, what are your thoughts on that impact and where we're, where we're at? That's just, I get that question all the time and it's a little hard to follow exactly what the solution is and what's going to happen. Well, the, the challenge is Caitlin, the solutions are out there, but government is slow to act. Um, I don't think it's desalinization because it's way too expensive. It's conservation. Now, California is doing some things, um, you know, they're going to try and activate like five desalinization plants. And, uh, um, but, you know, the water is just being shared by so many people down that Colorado River. But in my interview with uh, Jim that one time, he, he said, if we don't do anything, we've still got a 50 year supply in our aquifers. Mm -hmm. But having said that, there's areas that are are their wells are going dry. And one area that's in fact, I got a video coming out on this Sunday night, um, city of Scottsdale cut off water delivery for Rio Verde, uh, effective January 1st. Well, that place never should have been developed because they didn't have water. So they were getting water from Scottsdale delivered by truck. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is they've all got septic systems out there. So Scottsdale can deliver the water but they never got to recapture it. Mm. So they launched this conservation effort and they go, sorry guys, we, we just can't afford to sell you this water anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think it's eventually, if they don't do something, yes, it's going to eventually hurt our market. Um, but you know, it, it's the, the jobs are still coming here. That's the main catalyst. But I think, you know, the stuff that has to be done has to be done over the next, I'd say 10 years. And there's so much that can be done, just like drip irrigation for farms lowers their usage by almost 70%, the new mm -hmm. technology. And that's where all the water's going. Yeah. We use less water on households than we do on farms. Right, right. And don't, uh, I think uh, these chip plants use a lot of it too, right? And that's they what I was told. No, they, they borrow it. Oh, they borrow it. So okay. They, Chandler, for example, I think they use 9 million gallons, uh, like, I want to say a, a day. I could be off. It could be a month. But the water goes into their systems, and it gets really purified because they use it to cut the chips. Mm -hmm. So they get rid of all the impurities, and then they refilter that water again, and they shoot it back to a, you know, they shoot it back to a plant that they have in Chandler. And then it gets shot right back down in the aquifers for Chandler. Mm -hmm. So they, they borrow it. And uh, I, I talked to the water guy for Chandler. I go, man, how do we put these chip plants here? He goes, well, they, they, deliver, they take our water and they give us cleaner water back. Nice. Well, that's you good wouldn't, to know. You wouldn't know it if you tried to drink it out of the tap, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not <Yeah>. recommended. <laughs> God awful. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think about the CMI these days? Do you think we're going to get below 90? We've been dipping into the 90s lately. Oh, yeah, clearly. I mean, you look in Queen Creek and Maricopa and Buckeye are already, what, 64? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the CMI is just a measure of between buyers and sellers. And uh, um, it's interesting how the graph kind of has met at this one spot and hasn't moved. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, um, you know, we're at a stalemate. And so I think the, uh, um, it, it's, I don't say anything's going to make it go up, I guess is my short answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we do have the demand sitting there because of the jobs. Um, and there's a lot of industry coming here there are a lot of jobs, um, that will be here in the next two, three years. And so I think we, that is a good strength of our market, but until things are affordable, we have the same problem as we did 
six months ago just for different reasons, right? Rates are too high, so your payment's too high. Before it was prices were too high, um, but your rate was low. So everyone kind of made that work uh, as best as they could. But um, now we're just at a point where it's still unaffordable. And I don't know, I don't even know if prices are going to come down enough to make it affordable when rates are as high as they are. I mean, we have, I think, a long way to go. Well, we did we did discover that five and a half percent is a sweet spot. When mm-hmm. five, we got five and a half percent, the buyers came back. When we mm-hmm. got above it, they went away. So we know because, you know, looking at the data. So when we get five and a half percent, um, you know, England had to pivot. Their pensions were in real trouble and they had to pivot. They were tightening like we were. They had to back off. We're probably going to be in the same situation. Our mm-hmm. pensions aren't the bell of the ball either. And then the other thing that we've got that's coming at us like a freight train right now is we've only got 23 days of diesel left. Interesting. And, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, we just have, we don't have enough supply. Now imagine the prices that people are going to pay for, for diesel and not just your diesel truck to tow your, tow your RV, but every truck that's on the road that brings you groceries is powered by diesel. And it's, it's in them out in the Northeast, people use diesel for, for fuel. And some of their home heating bills are going to be $2,000 a month. And so they, they're trying to find a solution to that now. And again, you know, wheels of government turn slowly. I read that there was a 90,000 gallon ship uh, hauling diesel over to Europe and they looked on the uh, um, radar and charts that they have and it's turning around, coming back to the United States. So, um, so it's, there's just some weird stuff out there right now. It's causing a lot of anxiety and uh, that, that that could bite us. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. I didn't know that. Um, concessions, seller concessions are are a nice thing. I've been talking about that a little bit lately, um, about buyers and their ability to get concessions. Um, and, you know, it's hard to compare. I guess it's, it's which, um, what's the word? Pick your poison, right? We have a previous market where like you had to outbid everybody and go way above asking and then pay an appraisal gap. And now you have a market where you may have a really high rate, but at least you have the opportunity for sellers to buy down the rate for you and negotiate a concession because that the amount of concessions we're getting right now is like really high compared to we're, we're at like 42 percent. And I think the long term average is somewhere around 35 percent. And I think it's going to maybe go closer to 50 percent and above over the next couple months. And I think that's why asking prices have leveled. Mm-hmm. We're saying, well, instead of lowering my asking price. Why don't I be willing to kick in ten or fifteen thousand in closing, mm-hmm. and let them buy down their rate? Yeah, because uh, that's what people are really looking for. In fact, I I wouldn't buy down a rate myself because sometimes the math doesn't work. But if you want to pay for it, you know, I'll take it. Sure. Yeah. Do you think I was thinking about this lately? Um, and I know we've done two one buy downs in the past, but do you think that there's going to be ever any effect on that? Um, you know, next year or in two years from now, let's say rates don't really come down significantly. And now we have all these people with two, one buy downs that their rate goes back, goes up um, to where, from where it is now. um, And they can't afford it or their, you know, their situation hasn't changed. Do you think we'll start to see like a increase of listings or even, I don't know, maybe even pre foreclosures because of all the two, one buy downs? They have to qualify for the final rate. So mm-hmm. let's say it starts at four and a half and it's five and a half and then it's six and a half. They have to mm-hmm. qualify for the six and a half. Right. So right. But then they have to be smart. And so the mm-hmm. first year you can't, you know, don't take on a whole lot of debt year one and year two and three. So yep. that, cause you know, that's coming. Now yep. there's, there's always the outside chance that, that, you know, it'll be a lower rate, but gets us back to our earlier conversation when people go, Oh, get the high rate this year. Cause next year they're going to be low and you can refinance. That's almost criminal. Mm-hmm. Staying in your I, lane. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, even if you can qualify now, it doesn't mean you won't have a job change or an illness in the family or something that changes your ability to pay even your current mortgage, let alone if that payment goes up when you're back to the normal rate. So and it sounds all fine and dandy, but we really can't predict where rates are going to go. And you just kind of wonder if there will be some fallout effect from this. I don't know if it'd be massive, but I would be nervous if I was on a tight budget as a buyer and getting in and then kind of like holding on to this two, one buy down thought for the rest of. Yeah. I, 
I, Caitlin, I wouldn't buy without certainty. Yeah. Because you know, you're going to stay there a long time. So like, can I afford mm -hmm. this payment? Yes. Okay. Do I like the house? Yes. P pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it may go down in value, um, but, um, you know, but you have more variety now to choose from um, than you did, you know, last year. And if you find that nice house, do it and, you know, and treat it like your 401k. Just don't look at it for a while. <laughs> right. Right. But, but keep the payment steady. Mm -hmm. Don't don't get yourself in that optimistic situation. I bought a home in the 80s and it's the dumbest loan you've ever heard. But I was stubborn. It's like, you know, like, ah, oh, rates are going to go down. I know they are. You know, they can't possibly go any higher. And and it was the dumbest loan I've ever had in my life. I got out from underneath it. I was lucky. Yeah. yeah. Oops, sorry, got so you're being attacked. So I'm pretty sure it's probably Amazon or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on that note, have you had anyone doing uh, like seller financing? Have you seen more of that, like creative financing later, lately? No, I'm seeing more and more of it kind of starting to show up on uh, the MLS, seller willing to carry back. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not experienced any of that myself. Yeah. Uh, I know that Jackie, who's on here, she's uh, she's got one now that the seller said that they're willing to, you know, to carry back. And uh, um, it's that was really popular in the eighties, especially VA loans. You would do what's called a wraparound. You know, you'd assume the 4% VA and then, then you had like 11% here and you blended them. So you kind of had two notes. Mm -hmm. um, I hope we don't get to that crazy time again. Cause I wouldn't even know how to write it. I just, uh, I don't want to learn anything new at my age. <laughs> <laughs> just keep it all the same. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a little bit. A little bit more about VA assumable loans, um, people doing that recently. I haven't done it myself, but there's been some more talk about that. Well, one of my concerns is that if we do get in a situation where we have a liquidity crisis um, and the, the, the Fed and the Treasury have to retreat from this aggressive rate hike we got now to keep us solvent, man, real estate's going to go nuts again. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to see that. Right. Um, I, you know, I, there was nothing harder than going out and looking in the house and smiling at the other 20 people that were in line. You just felt like such a doofus. Yeah. <laughs> no. well, what do you think we should offer in the house? I, I don't know. I know. <laughs> what's your best and highest? Where do you feel comfortable? And let's just throw the hail Mary and hope it works. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it was, it was tough. Now I saw one this week. Um, it was down in Chandler. And this guy, this investor bought it and immediately turned it the next day, right? Mm -hmm. So he bought it for like four fifty and sold it for four seventy five. So it's obviously a wholesale deal. Mm -hmm. That guy remodels it, beautiful home, soup to nuts, looks like a million bucks, puts it on the market at six hundred fifty thousand at the end of May. And he keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower. He's four ninety nine today. Ouch! Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, that was the worst time to list a house was May, June. And I had a few clients do that. And we were unsuccessful because all we were doing was chasing the market down all the way. Um, and you just couldn't get in front of it fast enough because it's that, you know, you're looking at comps, but comps don't really matter anymore when prices are just continuing to go down. Yeah. What's this uh, seller? Offering concessions uh, rather than changing the price. Well, you know, the, the house purchase is payment driven. So, you know, if they're trying to buy a house and they want a lower payment, then the concessions can be, you know, the money can be applied to buy down the rate. If they lower the price, so let's say they come in with $20,000, okay, hey, $20,000 at seven and a quarter how much is that that you're saving because they lowered the price 20,000 versus that $20,000 prepaying the interest rate either for the life loan or for a period of loan. And now you're paying, you know, 6.7 or 6.5, mm -hmm. maybe even lower. So it, 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 it lowers the payment more than a price reduction. Mm -hmm. And it's also more affordable for the seller. They save some money too, because when you actually look at the numbers, 
what they'll net at the end. It may, it's, it's not a huge difference depending on the percentage, but it might save them a thousand dollars or so, uh, maybe more just to give a concession versus taking it off the, the price at the end of the day. So a lot that's of different the advantage ways to skin a cat. So. <laughs> yeah, I know it gets confusing, but that's why a good lender can help because they can help run scenarios. Even if you're representing the seller, they can run some scenarios on what the seller could offer to kind of have a win-win between the two. Yeah. And it, it's really important for everybody too, that, that you know, the, the real estate agents on both sides really have to communicate and work together on these right now because um, mm -hmm. a lot of moving parts. So, you know, you don't want that that listing agent that's folding their arm and saying, give me your highest and best, because that's not the market that we're in. And you want you want to be able to have very open discussions. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we want to write you an offer um, and uh, uh, please confirm when you get it. And nothing drives me nuts more than I mean, I got three offers on this one house and it was all written wrong. And I mean, he didn't include my agent code, didn't even include my broker. He put down it was on septic when it or on sewer when it was on septic. And so we just wrote a counter offer back with all these corrections, right? Then he he sends another offer and then says he's rescinding it. So he rescinds it. Then he sends me another offer. And it's again, it's even lower. All of the <laughs> stuff is missing again. Or nothing on it. But we sent him a counter offer, no reply. I'd send him a text the next day. Did you get that? Oh, yeah. I'll, let me let me send that over. And so he completely redraws and writes me another offer again, instead of sending over a simple one page counter offer. Guess what's missing? You know, all the other stuff, all my information. I finally told him, I said, I can't present this unless you write it correctly. And yeah. you can't be that agent in this market, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, for sure. That's uh, it's frightening how that happens more often than you think, but yeah, I can't really get away with it. <laughs> now, uh, good question, Marsha. Um, here in Arizona, in Phoenix, we're not seeing as many concessions at the in the luxury range in that price range, one point four million or so, um, because those buyers aren't as rate sensitive. A lot of them buy with cash, um, so I'm not sure about the climate in Colorado. Uh, it could help, but I think you see those concessions a lot more in that like sweet spot of our price range of between like. 300 to 600, 300 to 700. We're seeing most of them. Yeah. Yeah. That upper end is not getting, I mean, I showed a million dollar house last week. It was a million one and they got two full price offers the day after we went. Yeah. Some crazy things are happening in that million dollar price range right now. They're going fast uh, still. So, and there is a lot of cash in that price range too. Should a buyer have the listing agent represent them in the purchase or should there be a separation there to avoid conflict of interest? That's a tough question. Well, what's the advantage, uh, D. Rich? What's the advantage of having the listing agent handle it? Because you're not saving any money. I mean, you're not, you know, they're still offering a, you know, maybe a two and a half percent, you know, listing commission, two and a half percent buyer broke so he's going to get the full five percent and unless he negotiated something separately with the seller that said if i you know if somebody comes in i'm represented i'll do it for four i don't know they can do whatever they want but there's no advantage and it's not during the price negotiation that the buyer's agent is helpful it's you want to be represented during the inspection period because that's mm -hmm. where the knives come out yeah the, the whole process really, it's like, um, you know, it, you really want to have your representation because it gets sticky. And I've done this before and it's hard because you want, when you're not fully representing only one party, can anyone as a human truly fully represent both parties at the same time when they have different interests? No. So yeah. you're more of kind of mediating, trying to get the meeting of the minds rather than fighting for one or the other. So I think it depends on the market, your comfort level, if you know the agent or not, if you trust the agent or not, you know, there's a lot of factors, but I think keeping them separate is typically a better. Well, you don't really go. get to negotiate. So let's say that on the repairs, the seller says, well, look, I'll fix this, this, and this, but I'm not going to fix this bottom item unless I absolutely have to. 
So hold mm -hmm. back on that. So now you're going to go to the buyer. Now the buyer wants everything fixed. And you know on this side of your head that, that you can get all this done except for that one thing. But maybe you can get it later. And, you know, how do you, how do you play both sides? You tell the mm -hmm. buyer, okay, well, I'll go back again. And I'll ask so we get everything fixed. And so you go back to the seller and go, well, the buyer wants everything fixed. And so you, you, you can't openly say, look, um, he doesn't want to fix the roof. You know, so um, let's go back and say this, this, and this. So it's, it just makes it, I, I don't like them. It's too, I, there's too much liability. Yeah, it's, it. they're tough. Definitely tough. I had a new DR Horton in Levine and sold it in 2006. Is Levine today just a rental town? No, there's a lot of owner occupants in Levine. Yeah, I haven't done any business out in Levine this year, so. Yeah, I I haven't done too much, but everyone I've sold to there has been, um, has been an owner occupant. What, um, how slow do you see December? And I would say right now we're 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 running twenty two hundred contracts every seven days. Yeah, yeah, that I think that will go down to maybe fifteen hundred. <clears throat> That's my guess. Yeah. It's going to be quiet for sure. It's always a little quiet, but it's going to be real quiet. I think this year. I listed my house a few years ago when I lived in Fountain Hills and we listed it on Christmas Eve and had a contract New Year's Eve. Wow. As people That's were awesome. out and about, and these people were down from California for holidays and they wanted to buy a house. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, the serious buyers are out there then. So it's, it's kind of a catch 22. It's, it's a, Sales are really slow, but everybody else is taking their house off the market. You might be the only one on the block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That it's the best. Um, I, there is an advantage for sellers in that way, but there's a big advantage for buyers too, um, because you're one. You're only out there with the serious people, and there's probably sellers that listed their house like around now, and then everything slowed down because days on market is traditionally higher this time of year anyway. So by the time December comes around, they're like, we just got to sell this house, you know, and they want to sell it before the end of the year. And you can typically get a little bit of a better deal in the fourth quarter as a buyer. Yeah, it's all eyes are on the numbers right now. And Phoenix says, must have priced it right. Yeah, I think we did that. You know what? <laughs> that was my first sale owner agent. <laughs> That's awesome. You did it well. I did so many things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> No one needs to know. You got yeah. through it. <laughs> it's the first one. The first one. So I uh, um, I did a video the other day on comps, just like what you mentioned. Uh -huh. You know, that, that, and especially these online, Zillow, Redfin, toss them out. They, they're no good. Because right. they, they go back three months. They do an, mm -hmm. an average, an algorithm. They spit out a number. It doesn't mean anything now. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to ignore them. And the people are pricing... Mm -hmm. At, you know, well, Zillow says, all right, well, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. shoot yourself in the foot if you do that. Right. I think when I looked at appreciation this week, we're at, um, or not appreciation, I was looking at um, median prices and we're at about September of 2021 pricing, I think, yep. when I checked yep. somewhere in there. So, yeah, I mean, comps from May aren't doing you any good. Yeah, that's what you have. To, I mean, that's the right approach you take there. Just like where where is pricing right now today? Mm -hmm. I mean, I took one in Scottsdale earlier in the year when things were really hot and they were starting to turn. And I'm sharing the data with them going, you know, it's turning. You you may not feel it on your block, but it's let me show you. Boom, boom, boom. And and he was so upset that he didn't have 30 people through his house that weekend. He only had two. What are mm -hmm. you doing? And, you know, that's when real estate agents get yelled at like. I, I showed you things were turning mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. um, you know, you're not going to get somebody. He says, well, I don't want to, uh, uh, I don't want to agree to an inspection. I said, well, it sounds like you don't want to sell your house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. I was that's glad right. when that one was over. Yeah. I had a couple listing presentations around that time and uh, I didn't get them. They did not select me. And I think it's because I told the truth and I don't think they believed me. I don't know that it's that they uh, 
didn't want to know the truth, but I just truly don't. I think with the media and everything that they're hearing, they're like, this girl's crazy. What is she, what's she saying? Slowing down. Well, yeah, I bet you can expect that, you know, the average homeowner, they don't, they you know, they don't have their pulse on the market. I mean, they talk to their next door neighbor and the mm -hmm. person across the street and, you know, they'll see something on channel 12, but they don't, you know, I wouldn't expect them to know it the way you and I live it and breathe it. For sure. Yeah. Yep. That's probably why we drink more. 100%. <laughs> wine is my best friend. <laughs> Coffee and wine just keeps me alive. I think if we get a softer tone from the Fed next week, we could see some slight improvement on rates, which could lead to a busier end of the year than expected. It's possible. I think it all hinges on rates and what the market does. I don't know. I don't see an opportunity for a softer tone. Um, yeah. If, if I sound like a pessimist, but I there's couple things going on. One, the fuel prices is not, you know, Saudi Arabia. Look, that's a big deal. Uh, they're, they're, they gave us a two week warning and they're cutting back production. They have told the world that there will be some pain associated with that. So fuel prices are going to come flying up. That adds to inflation. The Fed has no choice, but their challenge is they're trying to pull back on the amount of money that's been put into the system at a time when, you know, the, the administration spending money, like there's no tomorrow, but the other thing that people should watch out for and do some reading on is, you know, England sold a bunch of our treasuries. China dumped them. So did Japan. So there isn't much of a market for our treasuries, and that's hurting liquidity. So Janet Yellen has come out and said, we may need to create another agency or another mini like central bank to handle these transfers to keep things liquid. In other words, you don't want another Lehman Brothers crisis. So right. a lot of stuff out there. And, uh, um, you know, I, re I, I read all this stuff every morning. So there's certain numbers that I follow. And I, I follow the fuel prices and uh, the food prices because that's that hits your wallet. Mm -hmm. And that, yep. that affects, you know, how much house you can afford. Right. It all trickles down. It all, everything that starts there affects what we see today um, and everyone's day to day. I agree sure. with be rich uh, They're, they're going 75. Yeah. They're not. And you know what, but here's the, here's the trick that's already been priced into the market. Mm -hmm. the bond traders have already, you know, they're pretty much cemented into that 0.75. So when he announces it, it's not going to budge. The rates might even go down that day. Right. Right. It's expected. That's for sure. Yeah, the rate hikes take six to nine months to be filled in the economy. Yeah, I I don't know enough to know if that's you know exactly true, but if that is, then we're in big trouble. Yeah, the wheels the wheels turn slow, and it takes just as long to turn it around. So yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like Las Vegas when when the general economy in the United States you know goes down, tourism in Las Vegas immediately drops off. But then yeah. when the rest of the country recovers, it takes them 18 months to recover because you and I have to save the money to go to Vegas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's always this lag. And yep. uh, so, um, for sure. Well, Rick, we made it 53 minutes. Holy cow. I wonder how many people are asleep by now. So. <laughs> I guess uh, we were somewhat entertaining. Uh, <laughs> well, it was good. It was good to talk to you again. And I, I, I appreciate the collaboration and you reaching out because, you know, we we kind of share the same audience. So it's kind of fun to see. And it's nice to have the different perspectives out there. You know, I might mm -hmm. think the market's going this way. You think the market's going the other way. And but it, again, it, it illustrates that that we're all spitballing. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, nobody knows. Nobody no. knows. And nobody yeah, knows. <laughs> yeah, don't want to make any predictions because I'm sure they won't be right. But all we can talk about is what's going on today, what we're seeing. And I think we, you know, we both are very good at sharing what we're seeing out there at, in our jobs. Right. It's not just looking at numbers um, as some of these other channels are. We actually have stories and experiences to back it up and like know what the consumers are saying. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of value that we can bring with that, just the context in itself. Well, I appreciate all of that and hope to see you again. Uh, I know we email yeah. each other from time to time. So, yep. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you joining and uh, thanks for all of you for commenting and asking your questions. We'll do this again sometime. So yeah, I think you had about four or 5 million people on. So, 
Uh, yeah, just about, that's pretty typical for me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Thanks, Rick. Take care.